All right, well, let's get started. Welcome. Good morning. Glad to see everyone here. Uh, this is the 2016 Stream of the East show. My name is Dan Rayburn. I'm the conference chairman. Uh, I will be the person you see running around the hallway looking frantic, uh, but I'm always available to talk to anybody. So if you have any questions, if you'd like to sit with me and go through the program, uh, that's one thing I do with a lot of attendees. I like to find out what it is that you're here for and what you want to learn so I can look at the program and tell you which sessions you should really focus on based on who the speakers are or what your background is or who you work for. So if you have any questions at any time, please do just stop me in the hallway, wherever I am. I'll also be doing two presentations myself on the exhibit floor uh, this morning and then this afternoon, so you can ask me questions during then as well. We've got a lot of content over the next two days. We have just over 100 speakers across 40 sessions, and we're covering everything from, you're gonna hear a lot about video ecosystems, workflow, Workflow is a big, big thing in the industry right now. VR, uh, 4K, HEVC, encoding. We've got topics on enterprise and education. So as you can see in the program, there's a lot to cover. If you can't make it to all the sessions, which you can't unless you're in four places at once or five places, we have five tracks. Uh, we are recording all the sessions. So everything will be available on demand. So if you go to streamingmedia.com slash videos, that's where we make all the videos available from all of our past shows. So we have four or five years of content up there from all of our shows from New York and California. Uh, in addition, for anybody who was here yesterday for the Content Delivery Summit or the workshops, we've already started posting those presentations online. If you go to streammedia.com slash east and you click on agenda, you can see the workshop presentations there. And if you go to contentdeliverysummit.com and the agenda page, you'll start seeing those presentations as well. So we have five tracks. We have uh, four main tracks in the show, and then we have uh, what's called the discovery track. So behind me at the end of the hall is track A. This is room C. So all of the tracks are here in this hallway. This is where everything will take place over the next two days. At 10 o'clock when the show floor opens, uh, we brought back something we call the streaming devices pavilion. So if you weren't here last year, didn't get to see it. We have um, six smart TVs all side by side and Connected to those is every streaming box in the market, and on those boxes is every OTT service in the market. So you can come get hands-on with more than 50 different devices and OTT platforms. We also have some uh, brand new 4K HDR TVs that aren't even in the store yet from Sony and Vizio that they nicely ship to us. So if you want to come test 4K streaming side-by-side -side on two 55-inch TVs, this is the place to do it. We're also going to be doing HDR demos as well. And then we have every streaming box in the market and then all the content platforms. So if you look in your program, I'm going to be doing two presentations at the pavilion today. Uh, one is, I think, around 1130 where I'm going to do uh, devices. And then later in the day, I'm going to do smart TVs. And I'm going to go through each one and highlight what they all do and some of the differences between them. So if you're interested in devices, come to the pavilion. All of these things are for you to get hands on with. You can actually pick them up and play with them and do what you like. So please come do that as well. Uh, we're going to have the reception at 5 o'clock on the show floor. So on the exhibit floor at 5 p.m. is when we'll start serving cocktails. Uh, and then finally, what my role is here at the show, you know, my job is really to help try and inform, educate, and empower everybody. So what information do I have that I can share? So I spend a lot of time as a matchmaker trying to connect attendees with vendors, with other attendees, with people that you want to share information with. A lot of attendees will tell me their story in terms of who they work for and the type of streaming deployments they're doing. And they'll ask me, who else here can they connect with that's similar that they can compare notes with? So stop me at any time if you'd like help with that. Uh, also, my cell phone number is listed in the program. So if you want to get a hold of me during the show, just call my cell phone. It will be answered. And then finally, at StreamMedia.com, you know, we pride ourselves on being available to the public, meaning um, really anybody, but really industry people, those who are deploying and adopting streaming and video services. So if you go to the help page on our website, uh, that phone number there is my cell phone number. I answer that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I've been doing that forever. So if you have a question at any time regarding anything in the video ecosystem, uh, we provide help as a free service. You can call us at any time and we'll help you out. So we're going to jump right into our keynote this morning. Uh, the way this is going to work is after the presentation, we'll have a Q&A portion of the event. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Jose is going to run around with a mic. That way we can capture everything for the, for the archives. Uh, and then after, at 10 o'clock when it ends, coffee will be moved to the exhibit hall, and that's when the exhibit hall opens. So uh, this morning we're going to be talking about 
uh, well, Serge is going to be talking about uh, what's taking place with some of the Android stuff and devices. So one of the things you can see after his presentation is we have a uh, brand new Sony TV on the exhibit floor that has Android TV built in. So you can come see that afterwards after his keynote as well if you actually want to get hands on with it. So we have a lot of devices out there. Uh, so Serge is going to be talking about content partnerships. He's going to be talking about business models, media players, televisions, basically what's happening with content and how we're creating, ingesting, and consuming content as consumers. Some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of the type of content that consumers want to consume, how they're consuming it, uh, whether it's mobile, whether it's to a, a streaming device, to a TV. Uh, that's some of what he's going to be covering today, and he's going to be talking about sort of the, uh, the total addressable market in terms of where the industry is headed for uh, content owners, distributors, and obviously us as consumers as well. So with that, please welcome Serge Kasarjan. All right. Can you guys hear me? OK, let's show this thing's on. There we go. Let's give a little bit of time. Well, it's good to see everyone. Uh, my name is Serge Kasarjan. I'm um, just quick context on what I do at Google and why I'm here. So I've been at Google for a very long time, uh, ever since the early days of Android and Android Marketplace. And my role has evolved over time, um, but it's always driven me to media and media and media. So when we first launched Android Marketplace, we had a whole bunch of phones going into market with very, very little content. And we were uh, going out there and getting people to build apps for, uh, for smartphones um, and trying to catch up with Apple and all the things that they were doing at the time. Um, and Android Marketplace became Google Play. And as we've seen the progression of Google Play, um, it's gone across all the different form factors that we think about, from phones, then to tablets, to connected TVs, to cars, to watches. Um, virtual reality, we've got cardboard in market, uh, plays distributing for that. So um, my role uh, at the company is focused on managing all of our uh, partnerships globally with all the big media companies. Uh, so um, everyone from your HBOs to your Showtimes to your New York Times to your sports leagues, um, uh, our team manages all of those uh, globally. Uh, internationally, obviously, Android has a huge footprint internationally. And we spend a lot of time on Android TV and all the emerging form factors that we're trying to take Android to. So Android is going everywhere, um, and we're, uh, we're trying to, to nurture that. Um, something just to keep in mind as we go through this presentation, uh, we're really trying to get an uh, overview of how we're thinking about the market and what we're seeing in the market, and then how we think people should be building apps for the market. So uh, we think Android is a example of how an OS can go in all these different places, and apps should be able to work responsively to all these different places as they go. So uh, typically when I'm in these conversations, uh, I'd like to make it as interactive as possible, but uh, given the room and given, uh, given uh, the Q&A at the end, we can go through a bunch of the questions at the end. Um, lastly, I'm... I was asked to put, to put on like a slacks and a jacket, which I typically never do. So um, uh, I do feel a little uncomfortable up here, but that's, uh, that's the way it should be. Um, all right, so let's just jump right in. All right, so just media industry dynamics and how we're seeing things that are happening in the media industry right now. Um, there's been 20 years of innovation in entertainment. So we started off in the 1990s with satellite TVs, DVDs, DVR. Um, and this was really the beginning of the digital uh, revolution for television and, and when digital really started to hit television. From there in the 2000s, we started seeing connected TVs, uh, streaming services. Obviously, YouTube uh, became a big, big player in the space. And then as we went into the 2010s, everything has changed. Everything's on the go. Everything's on demand. Uh, what is happening with linear? How important is linear beyond live events? Do people still think about linear? These are all the types of questions that we're asking as we're working with our app developers to make sure that they're creating the right content across, all, across the ecosystem. So in the last three years, we've seen an incredible amount of acceleration. So we've seen usage climb uh, by 25% across cord cutters. Uh, we're seeing a lot of things move online. Uh, Netflix is suddenly winning Emmy Awards, which is insane to think 
five years ago when we were talking about like Flickster, Netflix, and how the, the two things were, were going in two different ways. Um, YouTube broke the record for uh, most streams. Uh, second screening is becoming the second screen screaming is becoming the norm. Um, and now over 110 million US adults are watching through connected TVs. So you think about from 1990s to 2000s to 2010s, everything has changed in the last three years, and we're seeing that. Right? You just think about last year, HBO and Showtime making big announcements, Sling TV coming to the market. Um, a couple a month ago, uh, AT&T announcing. These things are all changing very, very quickly, making connected TVs even more important and understanding the usage of, of how connected TV should work. So we are very, very proud of our Android operating system. Uh, as I mentioned, we went from a very, very small user base very quickly internationally. Uh, we have 200 uh, plus OEMs who are developing uh, on Android across all of our different form factors. Uh, we have 80% of the global smartphone market share. Uh, we ship 100 or 1.5 million Android devices every single day, and we've shipped over a billion Android devices globally, and that number continues to, to climb. Uh, we announced these stats year to year at, at our big Google I.O. conference. So we, we will have a bunch of things that will hopefully uh, be announced ar around Google I.O. across products and exciting things. Um, so what are the types of media apps? So I'm always telling my team, think about the different categories of how you want to approach the people building for media. So right now we're seeing four real areas. We're seeing our digital only streaming services, your Netflix of the world. Um, then you're seeing TV everywhere, uh, connected, uh, connected apps, which are basically an extension of you know, SVOD services provided through cable or, uh, or, um, or linear services, so purely authenticated services. We're seeing cable companies starting to get very, very aggressive in the space. Um, Xfinity recently announced that they're putting uh, uh, apps on all the connected TVs, obviously with what Sling has done and what AT&T is thinking about doing. Cable companies are becoming much, much more aggressive around this and trying to think about it much more strategically than they historically had to. And then the last category, which we kind of try to keep a broad category, is entertainment information. What is the type of information that's being delivered from connected app experiences? So digital-only streaming services, uh, streaming services that are offering you know, content licensed. Again, Netflix is the easiest example. Um, these are monetized through ads, um, EST, um, and direct-to-consumer subscriptions. Uh, TV everywhere, uh, connected TV devices, uh, where, uh, where you're, you're seeing uh, authenticated through cable subscriptions, um, monetized through the traditional ad, ad um, and affiliate models. Uh, cable companies, uh, your MVPDs and ISPs, who have become much, much more aggressive in this market. And then finally, en entertainment information. We see you know, movie clips, IMDb, Flickster. You're starting to see some consolidation in this market as well, as they're trying to provide more video services uh, for their consumers and trying to have a halo effect. Now, of course, as I go through all these categories, these aren't end-all, be-all. Um, obviously, there's a lot of consolidation, as well as unbundling happening all the time. People are still experimenting. Uh, the, the very, very interesting thing about having an app is you can iterate very, very quickly. You can uh, A-B test your, uh, your audiences all the time and understand what's working. Different genres will have different things that work that potentially work for more niche audiences. Uh, sports will be different than news. News will be different than movies. Movies will be different than what potentially happens in pure VR plays. So, Apps people can iterate on very, very quickly and understand exactly what works and what doesn't work um, and what form factors it works on. Uh, phones may work better than connected TVs, which may work better than, you know, if it's, a, if it's something that's audio, it should be an app for a car. So a lot of these things that we're, we're constantly thinking about and, and tinkering with. Um, five trends that we're seeing revolutionizing the industry and impacting our development community. Uh, cord cutting is obviously becoming increasingly relevant. Subscription services are continuing to grow. Uh, developers are penetrating new form factors. A lot are launching internationally. You look at what Netflix did, and the announcement that Netflix made uh, back at CES um, was really around uh, globalizing their content. Uh, we have uh, divergent engagement strategies. Everyone's doing something a little bit different and trying to differentiate themselves. And um, content owners are concerned 
uh, with the loss of brand attribution. People are going towards subscription services rather than going to um, specific, uh, specific channels. Uh, you, look, you look at you know, 20, 30 years ago, everyone knew who the big broadcasters were. Now everyone knows who Netflix is and potentially who HBO is. Um, skip over this one, but cord cutting continues to grow with millennial audiences. Uh, and this audience is going to have more money in their pockets. They're going to be investing more, and they're going to be looking at subscription services more aggressively. Uh, millennials prefer to stream. Uh, Net Netflix and YouTube continue to be uh, the biggest streaming services, um, and others will grow. Um, HBO Go Now is obviously growing a lot, um, and you're going to see new players in the space. We've seen players like Crunchyroll and Drama Fever, who didn't exist years ago, suddenly becoming very important niche players that people spend a lot of time sitting down in front of and engaging pretty actively with. Uh, connected TV devices, which were mentioned, uh, are proliferating. You're seeing everything from set-top boxes to OTT devices to connected TVs. We've, we've tried to just uh, give a little overview of all the different ones here. And the main players are Google platforms, Apple's platforms, uh, Roku, Amazon. And you see most of all the big services are available on all of them. Um, content providers are not saying, should we go on all these connected TV devices? They're saying, how do we go on it? How can we get on there quickly? How can we build beautifully? How can we create incredible experiences for them? Uh, content owners are increasingly concerned with the loss of brand attribution. Uh, everyone is thinking of, I have a subscription to something that's streaming rather than I have uh, access to a TV channel or I have access to a show. Uh, the mindset has completely changed. Let's watch Netflix. Let's watch HBO. Um, when does Game of Thrones premiere on my streaming service? This is the mindset that, that's happening versus, you know, you look back 10, 20 years ago, it was much more brand attribution to, to the big TV-related brands. Um, so our content owners are reacting. Uh, you you rec recently saw uh, ABC's How to Get Away with Murder negotiate Netflix for uh, a logo in the, in the, inner, in the experience. Um, this is a direct reaction to this trend. They want people to attribute their brand with the content as it's being distributed everywhere. So you're going to start seeing this more and more, where you're going to turn on Netflix, you're going to see ABC or NBC or CBS, um, the guys who are trying to continue to preserve their brand, appearing. So that's the, um, uh, the overview of the media industry, uh, how we're thinking about it, um, what we're seeing. Uh, all, all these things help us respond and react to build developer tools, to build app strategies. Uh, ultimately, our team, uh, the most important thing for us is that the ecosystem succeeds. We want to make sure that people are building for Android correctly, that when they build for Android, they're building really, really successful businesses that are the right extension of their brand, and that will continue to help them you know, change and evolve with this world. So um, when we see someone like an HBO come to market, or when we see someone like Netflix working with us or any of the sports leagues working with us. We're really, really focused on making sure that those guys are succeeding. And they're looking at us as a channel for their, next, their distribution for the next 20 years. So what I'm going to go through right now is just an overview of how we work with these, with these developers. How do we work with our partners? What do we ask them to do? And what are the steps that they take to, become, to build successful businesses on our Android platform? And uh, going through providing information on what you can and can't do on Android, as well as uh, what we've seen other people do to be successful. Uh, there's a wide variety of people who have built incredible Android apps that have monetized a lot, integrated with our subscription services, um, to those who have kind of used it as, oh, I must have an app. And, because, and it's a necessary evil, which is exactly what we don't want to do. So the, we always start with design. Right? You look at design, and uh, it's very, very important that you use the conventions that we ask our developers to use. Uh, figure out what, where the right buttons are, where the right placements are, what the right surfaces look like. Uh, if, if you think about design and how it changes from platform to platform, every platform has a different design convention. Uh, so for us, it's something that we call material design. Uh, you'll hear this across Google where we are trying to create a very distinct look and feel for people who are used to using Google products to understand and feel how to work through material design. So we see a lot of developers actually make a big mistake. They come to our platform, 
and they take an iOS app, and they port it over, and they find some kind of software that will allow them to port the iOS app over to the Android app, and suddenly that app doesn't work. It looks terrible. And it's the equivalent of me flying to London, renting a car, and trying to drive on the US side of the street. I can't get anywhere. I can't move around. Everything is placed in the wrong way, and I'm not using the conventions that I should be using in a different country. Our Android users are used to Android interactions, Android designs, and the way Android should be versus, uh, versus what you would see on iOS. It's the same thing on television. It's the same thing on phone. It's the same thing on tablet. Everything is well material designed, and you'll see that consistently. So some of the principles of material design, uh, tangible surfaces, uh, delightful motion, so you'll see everything moving around, uh, a bold, beautiful aesthetic, and adaptive design. Uh, adaptive becomes increasingly more important as, you, as we expand form factors. So that one single app that you build should work across phone, tablet, watches, TV, virtual reality. It should, your users should be able to download it once and interact with it once from their Google Play listing. And, and then see it across all their different devices. Uh, so uh, developing, uh, and this feeds right into uh, the, uh, the, the TV-related aspect, uh, we are asking people to use our development tools. Um, we are asking them to use a multi-screen strategy um, and increase their viewing time using connected TVs, such as Android TV. Uh, we have tools such as ExoPlayer, which allow, allow uh, video playback to be much easier. And we can allow you to create immersive experiences using cardboard and VR, which is you know, the next, ne next natural extension of where media is going in terms of where content distribution can expand itself. So Google Play works across all of our connected TV experiences right now. You've got um, our cast integration, phone, tablet, uh, Android TV. Uh, we have some research that says uh, Smart TVs should have hit 200, 215, in 2015, 191 million uh, devices. So obviously, this is a huge opportunity for Google, huge opportunity for Android. Uh, we're going to continue to work through this. Um, our distribution strategy has been to work with set-top boxes, uh, OTT devices, and smart TVs, all with the same Android operating system and all with the same Play Store. So uh, if you look at televisions right now, uh, it's a very, very sim similar phenomenon as we had in 2008 with, uh, with smartphones. Back in 2008, there was this great dominant platform with Apple. They had one app store. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of fragmented different platforms from Nokia to Palm to BlackBerry. And each of those different platforms were going out and asking developers to build uh, completely different apps. So as a developer, you can only work on so many, so many platforms. Um, our strategy with Android TV is exactly the same. We want to help reduce uh, the, uh, the fragmentation that already exists in the market and ask people to build a single app and have that single app proliferate across all the different OEMs. Ultimately, it, the OEMs do what they do well. They build awesome devices and awesome hardware. Uh, the app developers do what they do well, bring great content, and reduce the friction of having to build from multiple uh, different uh, devices. And then us as Google, we create the ecosystem. And we create the app ecosystem and the software that allows you to distribute. Uh, real quick, we have obviously two solutions in the market. Um, we have Google Cast. Uh, the focus of Google Cast is to create a very, very simple integration that allows you to, to cast directly to uh, any cast-enabled television. And then we have Android TV. Uh, Android TV is actually a cast receiver. So Every Android TV has a cast receiver built into it. Um, some apps just require a video stream, and that's, uh, that's great. Some apps require a lean back, longer experience where you sit in front of the TV and you navigate through everything from a 10-foot uh, lean back experience. So we have both solutions in the market. They work very closely together. You build an Android app. You integrate a cast integration onto that Android app, and then if necessary, you'll create a TV UI and support that um, from a, a lean back experience. Um, but the, like I say, the most important thing here is every Android TV is, has a cast receiver. And anyone who's built for cast will be able to cast that app to an Android TV. 
Uh, we continue to see increased uh, time in front of apps. Um, the average time spent per interaction uh, goes from 17 minutes to 13 minutes to 39 minutes to 43 minutes um, as you get into larger and larger screen sizes. Uh, the last thing around developing is uh, Google Cardboard. Um, again, very similarly, uh, our team has been spending a lot of time on this lately. Um, when you look at Cardboard and you think about Cardboard, uh, it's an amazing opportunity to create new content type through virtual reality in a very simple, easy way. You can take your existing, uh, existing app and add something that we call VR view. Um, with VR view, you can easily upload the 360 content and it will show up in your existing Android app, uh, which is distributed through, obviously, the Play Store again. And Cardboard, just like we have done with phone and tablet, uh, our Cardboard device is a reference design for other Cardboard creators and third parties to create um, a cheap and easy way to, uh, to experience virtual reality, which for us is um, the gateway to hopefully more virtual reality. But for, um, for Cardboard, it's the way that we can get people to start using virtual reality. Uh, grow. So once you've built an app, how do you get that app everywhere? Um, how do you expand the app in front of your audiences? How do you distribute the app? So we have a number of ways that we tell our, uh, our developers to do so. Uh, number one, we're always emphasizing leveraging their own channels to message that the app exists. So you'll see now, every time someone has, a, has any kind of television commercial or spot, you'll see the Google Play Store badging next to the iOS badging. Uh, that's, we've been very, very proactive in asking them to, to include that, just to drive that awareness, um, and especially around major app updates. Um, apps are really, really expensive to build, especially for connected TVs. Like, if they're building those, they should be pushing their teams uh, internally to, uh, to market those. So if, you, if anyone watches a lot of Sports Center in the audience, you'll notice that this year, um, ever since the beginning of the football season, uh, Sports Center has been proactively pushing the existence of their app and to interact with their app. This is a big shift than what we, they did several years ago. Um, we've worked very closely with ESPN to get them to do that. Um, and it's, it's seen a lot of increased usage across all their different types of devices. Um, YouTube videos are a great promotional activity. You can deep link into apps through YouTube videos. Um, again, if you're watching the YouTube video on a desktop, it would link directly to the Google Play Store listing. That Google Play Store listing will drive an install to all your different devices that, that potentially have the app that exists. Uh, Temple events are something that we really push on. Uh, when we work with MTV, always telling them, you've got the Video Music Awards coming up. Let your users know. Drive surveys through your app. Get people to interact with your app from both a second screen experience and a native experience. Like get people to be using your apps during these big temple experiences that you're spending a lot of money on. Uh, within the Google Play Developer Console, uh, everything is built in for all the different ad app ca campaigns that drive uh, app installs. Uh, so we provide an interface that's very, very easy for our developers to go through and drive more and more ad installs uh, or app installs through the various ads. Um, so engage. Uh, one of the things that often gets overlooked is how do you engage your community of app developers? How do you get them to react and respond to all the activity that they're doing? Uh, so we've mentioned this, but a, a lot of, uh, we want people to position their communication around content as opposed to the brand. Um, Push content in front of them. Tell them that content exists. Uh, people forget to do that. Our big, our big developers are so focused on who their company is that they forget to say, hey, look, we have this piece of content, which in a world of social media and a world of when everyone's sharing what is happening in real time, the content is what really, really matters because it, that's what drives awareness to usage. Um, notifications. Notifications are a very, very tricky thing. And notifications occur on all of our different form factors. If you look at Android TV, uh, you look at the top bar, you'll see a form of notifications where it's telling you all the different content notifications. You look at our phones and tablets, we have something that's called rich notifications. Um, we, developers have to be very, very careful of notifications. If they overuse notifications, people will uninstall the app. At the same time, notifications are one of the big, big things that differentiate an app from a web view or just a simple interactive experience. <laughs> so so um, for us, we have a lot of best practices around notifications. 
we have a lot around use pictures and notifications, use the right cards and notifications, drive actions through notifications. Um, again, this goes back to investing all this money and time into apps. You should be able to continue to get people to engage at the right moments of time. Uh, the New York Times does an awesome job with notifications. Every, um, every morning, uh, if you use your Android app, you'll pull up your phone. You'll notice they'll have a picture um, which summarizes the top three stories um, from the day. Uh, it hits right around like 6 a.m. So when you pick up your phone in the morning, you'll notice what the story is. You'll see the picture, and there will be a drive for intent within the actual app, or excuse me, the notification. Great use of notification, uh, great use of engagement within, within the app. Um, targeted notifications, uh, pick the times that you send it. Again, back to the New York Times example. Pick the moments that you do it. Don't do it randomly. Uh, it's very, very important to train your users the way that they they should be interacting with the app and the timing they should expect things. Uh, in the New York Times example, I know to look for that notification every morning because I've seen it for a number of different times. Again, same thing across the board. Um, that increases the usage of these notifications. Uh, I mentioned this before, that, but Android TV's recommendation cards are basically notifications for television. Um, they allow, you, allow uh, content distributors to personalize content, bring it front and center when new shows are showing up. Um, it's, a, it's TV's way to notify the users that something new is happening. Uh, Google Now is an incredible tool to integrate at an OS level. Uh, Google Now manifests itself in many different places right now for Google. Uh, but uh, Android users really, really love this, and it's a big differentiating factor. So any, with all content developers, we're always pushing them to integrate with Google Now. I mentioned a little bit of this as well, but second screen experiences um, are something truly unique that you can do with connected TVs. Uh, whenever there is a big live event or whenever there is content being shown on the screen that, the, that can be interacted to with, with a second screen tablet or phone experience, uh, it really, really differentiates the content and really engages people. Uh, we live in a uh, generation of ADD right now where everyone is checking social media and checking every, all the different things at one time, that, use, that behavior is pr probably going to continue. But why not have that behavior be more focused on the content that's happening on the TV as well as what's happening on the phone and tablet? Um, launching an app, uh, how, do you get the, how do you get the app up and running? What are the best practices to optimize, uh, optimize the, the app launch? So. Uh, we have uh, these tools called Publish with Confidence tools. Uh, when you launch an Android app, you can do four different uh, steps to get the app out to market. Uh, step number one is alpha testing. Uh, with alpha testing, you can select a small group of users for your app that will see and interact with your app. And we'll be able to provide feedback. No one else will get this app. Only the people who you've defined as the alpha testing group and it can be a, a new build or an existing build. Uh, beta testing, uh, expanding that group to a bigger group. Uh, staged rollout. Uh, staged rollout uh, is a very, very interesting tool that allows for A-B testing of new products and features. I remember back in uh, 2006, 2007, uh, when Facebook first announced the Facebook feed. And um, historically, Facebook was always just static pages that people would navigate to one by one. Suddenly, everyone's information was right in front of it, and it was the feed. And um, everyone er erupted in anger. My privacy has been destroyed. Um, where is all this content coming from? Why is the content that I'm putting up there showing up in everyone's feed? And um, they basically turned it on immediately. Like, there was no users are coming. It, just, it was just turned on. And um, the feed actually ended up becoming the most popular feature on Facebook, right? People jump in there. They check their news. They're going into their feed. But it happened very, very quickly, and it was a very, very abrupt change. So, so you know, Facebook wasn't, didn't know how to market it, didn't know how to communicate to his users. They just turned on this feed. If they had used a tool like Staged Rollout, this would have been avoided. What Staged Rollout does is you can basically buffer how much you, you introduce a new product feature. You can do have 10% of my user, uh, uh, my, my user base get this new product feature then 20%, then 30%, then 40%, and see how they're reacting. If it's something dramatically wrong, you can roll it back. If it's something that is good but needs to be slowly introduced, 
you can do that as well. But it doesn't introduce a, a brand new product feature all at once to your user base. Um, which, going back to the Facebook analogy, the live feed was a great, 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 uh, great tool and a great engagement tool, but it happened way too quickly. And users weren't ready for it back at that time. And a staged rollout approach would have really, really helped. And then obviously the last thing is production uh, when you push live. Uh, developer pages and cross-promoting um, is, is a really, really interesting uh, promotion tool. You can cross-promote different apps within each of your developer pages if you have different apps across the board. Um, you'll see, I'll, I'll mention this in a bit, but you can also A-B test uh, different developer pages and localize different developer pages to see what's working and what's not working across, across your ecosystem. So um, uh, it, it's funny, uh, three years ago, I remember we were begging people to build developer pages. Like, just put a video up there. Put a description up there. Put, put, uh, you know, put all your assets up there. Now people, like their developer page, they've like hired a single person to just manage that all day long and manage all the reviews and do everything. It's, it's your storefront, right? And at the end of the day, it's, there, there's two big app stores out there. And there is one representation you have in front of those app stores. And this developer page is incredibly important on that aspect. Um, again, the nice thing about working with Google is you can actually track everything in one in one analytics tool base. Um, we've, uh, my team in particular has been spending a lot of time with subscriptions. Uh, we onboarded Netflix and HBO and Showtime in the last year, which has been, you know, them using our billing system is, is a really, really important, uh, important you know, uh, message to the market that you know, we've come together to, to share our subscribers. Uh, a big part of this is providing the tools to basically allow them to manage this um, through store listings, through subscription bases, seeing who their repeat buyers are, seeing what the churn looks like. Uh, we really worked very closely together with these developers to make our products better and help them make their products better. Um, one, one other thing that uh, our developers really like, especially some of our big subscription-based businesses, is they can see where their traffic is coming from in the store. So you can see whether it's Play Store organic, whether featuring campaigns within the store is driving it, whether um, uh, various uh, ad units are driving it. Just understanding and creating uh, transparency in this is very, very helpful. Uh, I actually mentioned this um, a second ago, but uh, we've introduced uh, this feature of allowing you to A-B test store listings. So uh, different markets act differently, different assets act differently, images, icons, uh, videos. Th they actually drive very, very different, uh, very different usage behavior. Um, and it, there's seasonality um, associated with it. When tentpole events, right, right now, you know, if you're HBO, Game of Thrones is playing, maybe you should put some Game of Thrones videos. And when Homeland comes back for Showtime, or when it's the NBA playoffs, like all of these things matter so that people don't think that the app is stale. Um, so we have a, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we have a bunch of best practices on store listing experiments that we provide in the developer console that we encourage our, our users to use. Um, all, all of these work across every single one of our form factors. Again, we look at Android as all one, one whole. Um, there's one very unique thing around Android in our community that um, currently doesn't exist on iOS. And we allow our developers to, um, to uh, interact with their, uh, with, with their reviewers. So if someone goes in and writes a negative review, um, you can actually go in and, and, and respond to that reviewer and basically say, hey, look, um, I understand that Monday Night Football is blacked out here. Or I understand that this authentication issue is happening. Here's, what's hap here's why it's happening. Here's how you can fix it. Here are some alternatives. Uh, users then go back in and they change their reviews a lot of times. Users respond to those reviews. Um, it allows people who are having the same issues to jump into the store listings and see what people are saying um, and realize, okay, wait, I'm not going to give them a, a one-star review because I just saw what, what, they're, what they're saying. Um, earn. So everyone wants to make money in the Play Store, right? Uh, we are running a massive, massive business. Uh, for our big SVOD services, uh, subscription billing continues to be a very, very important theme that, we, that we're pushing all of our developers to do. 
Um, so we look at our funnel in four different places. Uh, the number one part of the funnel is user acquisition. Then we go into subscriber conversion, subscriber billing, and subscriber retention. We have a whole bunch of different uh, play billing features that we're now integrating that allows, uh, allows uh, our, our SVOD partners to make it much, much easier to, to, uh, to interact with their audiences, reduce churn, work on all these things. And I think it's a testament now. You look at, like I mentioned, Netflix we was integrated just recently. Um, and all the big SVOD services are all integrating with our billing services, which I think uh, is a very, very good sign for, for the rest of the market as we're, as, we're thinking about, as we're thinking about others. There are going to be so many OTT services that are going to be coming out in the next you know, three to four years. Um, you know, our hope is everyone integrates with our billing services and uses all the tools that we've invested lots of money to build on. Um, New York Times uh, initially was using their own billing system. Uh, they integrated play billing in 2014. They saw, we have a case study of this online, they saw 125% lift in subscriptions in the first month, 254% year over year. Uh, Showtime is starting to use it. Uh, a lot of these big SVOD for services love our free trials features. We're constantly adding new ways to, uh, to experiment with different types of trials, um, which as, as a lot of these guys like Showtime and HBO are going into the market for the first time, they're trying to experiment and understand how to uh, provide the right types of promotions and trials, and our tools provide great services for that. Um, th this is something that we're seeing more and more is this front porch method. Historically, what you would see for any SVOD service or any authenticated service is you download an app, whether it's TV, anywhere, and you just see a wall. And it would say log in or buy. And that was it. And uh, with so many alternative content types out there, we ask people to build a front porch. Have people watch an episode. Have people watch two episodes. Uh, have people interact with this, with your content, and you know, quite frankly, get addicted to your content. Right? Put two episodes of your newest show out there. Um, if, they're, if you're going to acquire that subscriber, they're going to stay in anyway. Um, and they're not going to not subscribe because they've seen the first two episodes. In contrary, they're probably much more likely to jump on there because they're addicted to the show. And they don't want to go to their friend's house or go somewhere else and figure out a way to do it. Plus, they've already started interacting with your app. They've downloaded the app. There is a little bit of investment of time and effort to start doing that. Um, and once they've done that, it's, it's, going, to, uh, it's going to increase the uh, subscriber acquisition rate. So we love this idea of a front porch method and having, content, uh, having some content before actually driving a subscriber in. We're working on people on this. Not everyone has done it yet. Um, multiple plans, multiple types of payment options. Uh, with Android and Play, um, we obviously have direct carrier billing. We have PayPal integration. We have a bunch of different things, which reduces friction. So we ask our content providers to also reduce friction by providing different types of subscriptions. Look at different markets that you're in. How should different, different markets probably should be priced differently and provide different options for free trials? We allow all of these different things, and they, they should be able to set up all the different SKUs. So this is an example, I think, of how Netflix does it. Um, multiple plans, I mentioned this. Uh, you know, some people want to buy on an annual basis. Some people want to buy on a monthly basis. Some people want to buy on a weekly basis. Um, allow all these different SKUs, um, subs pick up subscribers in every possible way, reduce the number of uh, points of resistance as possible. Uh, going global, and this is the, the last piece here, uh, for us, uh, Android is a massive footprint internationally. And this is, you're seeing this with um, Android TVs right now. Uh, we have some set-top boxes in France, Japan, Korea, who have all inter integrated. Um, you're seeing this with obviously our phones and tablets in emerging markets. Um, and our content providers are going global as well. Um, like I referenced the, the Netflix example at CES, everyone's going everywhere. And um, those barriers are starting to come down on where you can go, especially with OTT and new content forms. So it's very, very important to think of audiences from a global nature rather than just a US-based nature. So um, I keep going back to this Play Store listings, but um, Localizing those descriptions are really, really important. Uh, when you put a trailer in the listing, make sure that it's market specific. When you put 
uh, the language in the listing. Make sure that you're using the, the localized language. Um, put the content that's most popular in that market in the Play Store listing. Think about each market from, as a unique audience, as it is a unique audience, and they interact with your content in different ways. Um, and then try out a whole bunch of different pricing in different markets. Uh, Netflix has done this very, very well. Um, you go to the different markets, they have the, the pricing in their local currencies. You don't, you're not opening up Netflix and you're seeing the same pricing as it is in the US. You're seeing the localized local currency pricing. And that is it. So how did I do on timing? I think I'd... Check, check. Ah, oh, there we go. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. First of all, nice round of applause. Good job. Thank you very much. So about 10 minutes for questions. I saw a hand over here. Saw a question. Somebody raised their hand over here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Terrific presentation. Very comprehensive. I want you to grab me by the lapels and tell me, what am I missing if I only have Android on my Kindle, but not on my phone? Yeah, right now, there are, there are certain apps that are on there. Um, at the end of the day, the publisher gets to decide which, where they want to put, put uh, their apps. Um, there are some Google apps that aren't, aren't on there. Um, also, a lot of third, uh, other apps aren't on there. Um, I think some of the issues with Am that Amazon potentially faces around that, and this is, you know, is how much distribution do they have, and have developers decided that they're going to put their apps on there. Ultimately, it's up to their team to go out there and source that content. Um, they've done a great job with, with Fire. They have every, like pretty much everything on there. Um, but ultimately, they have a team who is likely uh, getting all that content for them, and, um, and it's up to them, right? Um, I'm not 100% familiar with exactly what their content offering is and where their gaps are. Um, but from what I understand, they have most, most of everything. They've done a really good job of that. Next question. Right here. So if you're a publisher that already has Android mobile apps and you want to go to Android TV, mm -hmm. do you really recommend making this some kind of a universal app, or would you start with a new app for Android TV? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. So um, if you actually look at, um, in the early days of tablet, people were building two, two apps for phone and tablet. So what they would do is uh, you would see, like, it was funny, you'd see Android small, Android big, right? And you'd see Android uh, phone, Android tablet. And we're actually kind of seeing the same thing right now, right? People are building separate TV-related apps, partly because they're a little nervous about disrupting their core phone and tablet apps, building a bigger app, adding, um, adding more, like, more product and more features in that app. Um, at the end of the day, it's the developer's choice. Um, I think for everyone, it's different based on resources. In an ideal world, everyone would have one app listing, and that app listing would, you know, whether it's a single APK or it's two APKs, it would respond and react to different, uh, to different form factors. If, you know, if the team is as high as possible of technical competence and, and is, uh, you know, has the bandwidth and the resources. The ideal situation is you build a single APK. That APK would uh, respond and react and know it's a f tablet or a TV or a phone and have the wear and, and the auto SDKs integrated as well as have a VR interface. Um, we understand, especially in early, like we're in the earlier days of connected TVs right now where it's not always possible. Um, you know, people are using third parties, uh, people would want to keep it separate for various reasons of teams that are working on it and potentially authentication issues and you know, rights issues. And, um, so all these things come up. We want to be as developer friendly as possible and we want to understand why you would have two separate apps. But at the end of the day, in like a perfect world, assuming that you have all the resources possible to do it, um, that's, that's, the ideal, that's the ideal way to do it, is have one. It's also easier just to manage, too, right? You open up your developer console and you see one app. You see where all the traffic's coming from. You're able to, you know, you're now opening up two different interfaces. One other question. Yeah. On the media player framework, mm -hmm. um, 
the new XO player. Is that the player framework you'd recommend? To that's work what we recommend. That, TV? That's that's the one. That's the open source player that we that Google has built and is providing. So that's the one we recommend. Um, if any developer comes to us and asks us what video player should we be using, that's the one we recommend. We, but we don't uh, we don't push back on other third party players. Um, a lot of times. Uh, a developer has an existing relationship with a vendor that they've worked with for a long time that's providing a, a video player. Um, we'll work with the vendor, especially if it's a big developer, to make sure that that player is working well on Android. Um, but um, we think ExoPlayer is the easiest out-of-box solution um, if you're starting from scratch. And does that create any problems? I understand that it's backward compatible to 4.1. It is, yes. Does that create a problem for Android TV? Uh, no, because Android TV runs on uh, just runs on um, on NNL. Okay. Another question. Excuse me, MNL. Yes, right here. Hi, Diana Horowitz from Comcast. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Um, question: You had a, a chart showing engagement of viewers with growing with the size of the screen. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing, or how are you designing around duration of content? So, for example, long form, maybe you know some of the programmers you mentioned, the ABCs, the Game of Thrones you mentioned a couple of times, you know, encouraging the the long form content viewing maybe on the different size devices, since that tends to drive engagement. Yeah, that's exactly. So we uh, obviously longer form content does much much better on TVs uh, and lean back experience when you're sitting down. So. Uh, you know, it's tricky because we also have Chromecast, right? So with Cast, you're streaming from a phone. Uh, so we basically, our, our focus is put everything everywhere and figure out um, where your usage is coming from and how your users are interacting with it. And then from there, you know, tweak. And right, maybe from your TV experience, you put something up front in, in your app first. And on your phone and tablet experience, you put the shorter promotional apps up there first. Uh, but inevitably, you're not going to know until you put everything in everywhere, right? I mean, just natural human behavior. People are going to sit down on a couch, and they're going to watch something for a longer. I'm much more likely to watch, you know, I'm going to watch the two-minute basketball clip on my phone, and probably not on my TV, because I'm going to want to watch a whole TV show for basketball on my TV. As you can't tell I'm a big basketball fan. So. Great. Another question. This is your opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Hi there, uh, Jay Waltmanson from My Stream Planet. Um, thank you for that. Um, I had a question on content protection and how do you see what Google's doing across the platforms in order to facilitate content providers to, um, to deliver their content in a protected way? Yeah, so we have a, a number of uh, our own DRM platforms or DRM tools that, that you could that you use, but we also support uh, most of the major third parties who, you know, who provide DRM tools. So I think at the end of the day, um, I think we we do everything possible. Um, we are an open platform, so we are integrated with with other third parties. So and Android supports it. Um, so you know, my opinion is that we're we're doing everything we possibly can for content protection. Awesome. Maybe time for one final question. Here we go. This is Joel Espelin from the Diffusion Group. Um, do you have any thoughts or, or best practices on promotion of live content within apps, um, and particularly even possibly use of notifications? Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, notifications are a really, really important aspect of that. Um, I think the second piece of that is deep linking. Um, a lot of, so there's two parts of it, notifications, but then notifications potentially get static, right? So um, if you see your notification like an hour later because you put your phone down, it's probably, you probably missed it, right? So that's up to the content provider who put out that notification to also provide, you know, make a call on the server side to when that thing dies, having it as a, as a, as a, as a VOD service, right? But the one, I think the one underrated thing around live is making sure that all of your apps are deep linked into all the different places within the OS. So for example, if I see a link for a live event on Twitter, um, 
that live event should deep link directly into my app and it should call out my app. It shouldn't take me to like a static web page, which is, a, which is something that people forget, right? So much of social media drives interactions in live, right? So if you're in Facebook or if you're in Twitter or even a news site or anywhere, if something live is happening, uh, you should be able to call your, uh, your app and launch the app especially if it's installed. And if the app's not installed, it should be deep linked to the Play Store to download the app as a form of, uh, as a form of app acquisition. Great. If you've got a question, he'll be uh, sticking around afterwards. One quick announcement. Um, the show floor is now open, and we actually, at the Streaming Devices Pavilion, have multiple of these things hooked up. So you need to go check it out, drive around, play with it. Uh, the exhibit hall is open. There's coffee there. So one more time, a big round of applause for Serge. Thank you. And the exhibit hall is now open.